be looking at verse 16 and 17. Uh, we are continuing our series this morning uh, in Colossians, and uh, next week we'll be wrapping that up. Um, and so we're looking at Colossians, and it's really all about the supremacy of Christ. And Paul's writing to the Colossian believers, attacking the, the heresy that has infiltrated the church, the Gnostic heresy, and uh, and that it would really put into question the supremacy of Christ. And Paul wanted to make it very clear that Jesus is uh, supreme over all things. And so that's really the theme of this letter to the Colossian believers. So it's Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 16 and reading to verse 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks this morning? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you for your spirit that is here among us. God, we pray that you would minister to our spirits today. Speak to us through your word. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Everything that you do, whether you realize it or not, is an act of worship to the Lord Jesus. As believers, because we put our faith in Christ, because our life is not ours, right? We have been bought by the precious blood of Christ. Everything that we do is an act of worship to the Lord Jesus. Now, understanding this truth, that may shake us a little bit, right? Everything is an act of worship, whether we recognize that or not, as believers, everything that we do. So we cannot separate the sacred from the secular in our lives. As believers, we don't have different compartments of our lives. We don't have our church life, our work life, our family life, our private life, and, and our hobby life, and, and all of these other uh, aspects of our life. As believers, there is, there's not a, a separation between the sacred and the secular. Everything that we do is sacred. Everything that we do is an act of worship to the Lord. And so we have to understand that as we, as we go through our day, you are worshiping the Lord by your actions, by the choices that you make. And as believers in the Lord Jesus, all aspects of our lives are sacred and therefore is an act of worship. So when you go to work tomorrow morning and Mondays are wonderful, right? And there's, a, you know, messages that you have to get back to. There's a pile of paperwork that you have to do. Uh, whatever it is that is waiting for you on Monday morning as you go to work is an act of worship. To the Lord Jesus. So hopefully that changes your outlook. It changes how you view things when you realize that everything that you do is an act of worship. How many of you like doing dishes? Oh, but it's an act of worship. How many of you like vacuuming? It's an act of worship. Right? The things that we love to do, the things that we don't like to do, the mundane things of life, all of that is an act of worship. And how do we understand that this is an act of worship? Well, there's two things that I want us to look at in our text this morning that helps us to understand that all that we do is an act of worship before God. And the first is this, the power of the word of Christ. Paul writes in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word of Christ must dwell and live within us. All of its doctrines, precepts, and promises are to dwell and live uh, in us. We must receive the word of Christ without partiality. It's not our opinion, uh, nor do we try to twist it to fit what we want it to say or what we believe. We must bend and yield to it. All too often, this is, the, this is what we tend to do. We come up with our own beliefs and what we're comfortable with, and then we search Scripture to try to back what we want to believe. Right? That's usually what we try to do. Even if we, we say, well, I wouldn't do that, oftentimes we can't formulate our own beliefs, and then we search Scripture to try to back what we want and what we say. We have it reversed. Everything that we believe must be first in Scripture. This book tells us what to believe. It gives us the doctrine, the teachings of Christ. And so we uh, are to come before God's Word as a clay in the potter's hand and allow God's Word to shape us and to form us 
into what he wants us to be. Uh, many people, we, we, you know, we're good at cherry picking scriptures to back what we what we want. Um, I remember when Mandy and I were were dating, recording, you know, to to help bolster, you know, who I am that that you know she should marry me. I took her to a, a scripture, and it's only in the King James version that it works. Um, that it says, "Mark the perfect man." <laughs> Now, I didn't finish reading the rest of the verse, all right? I just stopped it there. Hey, the Bible says, Mark, the perfect man. You need not look any further. I am here for you, right? Now, that was in lightheartedness, and she laughed just as you laughed, and I didn't know how to take that laugh. Like, wait a minute. I mean, I know it was supposed to be funny, but, you know, not that funny. But oftentimes, that's what we do. Right? We have a belief. We have an opinion. And then we go to Scripture, and then we try to find it. And, and oftentimes we can be guilty of taking a portion of Scripture out of context or making it say something that it never, want, it never meant to say. I remember uh, as a kid watching uh, Little House on the Prairie, and there was one episode uh, that I think it was uh, Carolyn, the, the mother, and she, I think she, she had an infection in her hand, and, and, you know, she came across the scripture that says if your hand causes you to sin, to cut it off. She was about to cut it off, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. That's what people tend to do, right? Rather than searching scripture and finding out what it means, we have and formulate our own beliefs and opinions, and then we try to get the scriptures to back what we say. And the whole point of it is this. We come before the Lord as clay and the potter's hands and we allow his word to dictate to us what to believe and he tells us what is doctrine and he tells us what our opinions are and that we uh, must first receive his word without partiality we must receive god's word with joy all right oftentimes people look at the bible as a as a book of thou shalt not i don't see the bible as a book of thou shalt not but of freedom and liberty that if I will yield my life to what this book says, I will have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, sure, there are fences that Scripture puts in and says, don't do this or don't go here, right? There are fences, but those fences are there to protect us, to keep us. Just as a, as a shepherd would, would put up a fence around his flock so that, that it keeps out the predators and it keeps the sheep from going uh, into areas, into the fields where it shouldn't go into. Know a little bit about sheep. Not only are there predators that the sheep needs to be protected, but the sheep also need to be protected from themselves. And there are certain plants and and uh, uh, vegetation that if a sheep were to eat it, it would kill them. It would be poisonous, and they don't know that. And so the fence isn't just to keep the predators out, but it's also to protect the sheep from themselves, from their own ignorance. And we understand that God's word is that fence that he's put around us, not only to keep out the predator, but also to protect us from ourselves. And so we receive Christ's word with joy as a treasure that is worth selling all your possessions in order to obtain it. Now, we don't understand this in our culture because we have multiple Bibles, not just in the English Standard Version, but even in my office, I have multiple translations of the Bible. You go to a thrift store, and there'll be shelves full of all types of translations of, of the Bible. We have them all over the place. And I think in, in doing that, we've, we've forgot how sacred this book is, how precious the words are on the pages of this book. You go to the other side of the country, and I mean, of the world, and, and some some places of great deep oppression. And just to have a page of this book, they will risk life and limb in order to obtain it. Oh, that we would tap into that same joy and, and understanding of how precious this book is. Oftentimes we, we try to fling it around or maybe we don't even, we, we misplace our Bible. But uh, God forbid that we lose our phone, but we lose our Bibles all the time. We know where our phone is. It's right there with us. And I understand we can have our phone, a Bible on our phone, but there's nothing like God's printed word. Because when technology fails, when electricity goes off and the battery dies, 
you still have his word there. That we would receive it with that joy, understanding that this is a great treasure, that, that it is worth losing everything for. Matthew 13, 44 and 46 talks about this merchant who comes across this pearl. He sees the value of this pearl. And he goes out and he sells all of his possessions in order to buy that great pearl of great price. He tells another story of a man who found a treasure in a field and he sells all that he has and he buys the field so that he can have the treasure. May we understand that his word is that treasure, that it is worth selling all that we have in order to obtain it. And again, this is the application, that his word is the treasure that we push off and lay aside all of our opinions and all of our uh, preconceived ideas and that we obtain his word and apply his word to our lives so that we would be the people of God that he's called us to be. The word of Christ must live and dwell within us. As Paul says, richly, another word uh, that can be used in that same uh, word for richly is abundantly. That the word of God must dwell within us in abundance. The idea is that the word of God must not live in us sparingly, but in abundance. You can't get enough of Christ's word. I liken it to Rice Krispie Treats. You can't just have one. You don't eat those sparingly, right? I mean, you can't get enough. Think of your favorite food. And just say, just take a little nibble here and a little nibble there. There's something that goes on in our brains when, when we eat sweets, when we eat food that we like. It, there's a, a, a chemical reaction that goes on that, that just, that's why we oftentimes overeat and we eat so much to where it, it hurts us because there's a chemical reaction because it tastes so good we can't get enough of it and we keep shoveling it down our throats, right? Because it is that good. But here's what we ought to do with God's word. We must feast on his word just as we do all the foods and delicacies that we like. And here's the good thing is God's word won't leave us feeling bloated. You read God's word, it's not going to cause your arteries to harden. It's not going to create a heart attack or a stroke or any other uh, disease or, or health condition. When we feast upon God's word, we grow in our strength. We're able to resist temptation. We're able to resist sin because we are feeding our spirit man. We can't eat enough of God's word and get it in us. You don't have to worry about moderation when it comes to God's word. The Bible gives us this challenge. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. There's power in Christ's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This is not just a book of old stories and wise sayings. This is the word of God, and it's living and breathing, and it changes us. The more that we read it, the more that it permeates into our lives, and the more that it changes us into who he wants us to be. This is more than just some literary work. The word of God is powerful, and it's living and it convicts us of sin. I think sometimes that's why we, we tend not to want to read it as much. Because as we read it, we, we are faced with what we ought to be. And we realize that we're not there. And, and oftentimes we, we don't want that conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so we just kind of put it on the shelf. But the Holy Spirit brings conviction not to condemn us, but to bring about repentance and change in our hearts so that we can be the people that God wants us to be. Paul goes on and he writes teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Our text demonstrates the power of Christ's word that it teaches us, it admonishes us in all wisdom. It will make us wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. When the word of Christ dwells within us abundantly, we will come alongside one another and build each other up and encourage one another. We live in a culture that loves to tear each other apart, to devour one another. But the word of God, when it dwells within us, it allows us to encourage one another, to build one another up. If you've seen in the news, the Christian news anyhow, it, there's, a, there's an outpouring that's going on in Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. 
They went to chapel this past week. And they're still in chapel. If you've ever been to a chapel, you know that that's, that in itself is a miracle, right? Because sometimes chapel can be just, just chapel. But there's a hunger, and God began to pour out His Spirit. But as I was watching on Facebook, it doesn't take very long before people start tearing things apart. You see, when the Word of God dwells within us richly, we're not so quick to tear one another apart and begin to criticize what maybe God is doing. You understand what I'm saying? We, we build each other up. There are some that are saying, well, you know, afraid that this is some, you know, not real revival. And what is real revival? And I'm thinking, can we just allow God to move? Can we just allow him to move? And if this is of God, then God will bless it. But if it's, if it's of God and we're condemning it, well, then we're condemning what God is doing. That's not a good place to be. You see, the Spirit of God, as the Word of God dwells within us richly, we take this approach as God begins to move, as we see these things happening, we're not quick to tear down and discredit because we know that God moves. And we don't want to be on the wrong side of what God is doing. But we live in that culture that constantly wants to tear each other apart. May we, the people of God, people of the Word, build each other up and encourage one another. This is a picture of unconstrained, cheerful, faithful community that we see in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42 and 47, that they had all things in common. They were there for one another. When the word of Christ dwells within us abundantly, we will have mutual counsel, encouragement, reproof, interchange of experience. It doesn't mean that we just put a stamp of approval on everything that's happening. There is reproof. There is correction. But it's done with a spirit of humility. It's done with a spirit of, of, of redemption. Not to tear down, not to condemn. Thus Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. No wonder Paul goes on and he writes this, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. When the word of Christ dwells within us richly, abundantly, how can we not sing songs to him? And I love what Paul says. He says, singing psalms and hymns. Those are songs that are already written. Somebody else was anointed to write. You understand? These are songs that maybe you grew up listening to, grew up singing. So we recite them. But then he says, spiritual songs. Those are songs that maybe God has given you. Those are songs that, that as you are worshiping him, you're putting that prayer to a melody or to a harmony. So as we are dwelling in Christ's word richly and abundantly, we will sing those songs of psalms and hymns, but there will also be that time when we will sing a new song to the Lord from our hearts. And it'll never be recorded, it'll never be heard on the radio, but that's fine because it will be heard in the hallways of heaven before the throne of grace as his people sing those spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. To God. When I walk Sophie in the morning, I usually I spend that time praying as she's running around sniffing every nook and cranny of the park. And I'm thinking, you know, this is the same park that we go to every day, but I guess there's new smells and new scents that she has to explore. And she's thinking that there's a bunny under every tree. And, uh, and so as she does her thing, I just begin to worship the Lord. And there's times I'm singing a song that maybe we sang Sunday morning. Or song that we used to sing. But there comes a time in my thankfulness to God as I see the sunrise. I'm thankful for another day. I'm reminded of the God's faithfulness. Then there comes a point when I'm singing a new song. And it comes from a grateful heart. And sometimes I sing it just a few phrases. I don't may necessarily sing the whole song. Or I may... Sometimes I take this song, words from this song and mix it with this song with a whole other song's tune. But it doesn't matter because this is just me and Jesus time. And it's a way of expressing my heart of gratitude for all that he's done. You see, when we allow his word to live within us abundantly, then every moment of our day we are cognitive of the fact that we are dependent upon him. 
and his blessings are all around us. You see, he says, with a grateful heart, a thankfulness in our hearts to God. This shows that we understand that his goodness surrounds us. And we're not focused on what we don't have or what we're in need of, but we're focused on what he's already done. Second, it's the power of the name of Christ. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is why we cannot separate the sacred from the secular in our life. All aspect of our life is sacred. That whatever we do, we're to do in the name of the Lord. Whether it's word or deed. And both of these can really shake us. And again, understanding the heresy that Paul is addressing, the Gnosticism, right? Is that all matter, everything in the physical realm is evil. So that's why he says, in the deed, in what you're doing in the physical body, it is an act of worship. You do it in the name of the Lord. And so everything that we do, everything that we say, is for the Lord's glory. We've been called to be holy, for He is holy. If you're taking notes, here's some verses to write down that talk about God being holy and wanting us to be holy too. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. Leviticus 19, verse 2. Leviticus 20, verse 26. 1 Peter 1, 16. And there was many more, but those were those that I just... And I was going to read them. I thought, you know what? I'll just give them to you. You read them this afternoon and you'll be amazed at what God is saying throughout his word. He is holy. He's calling us to be holy. To be holy is to be dedicated, consecrated, separated. Therefore, since we are dedicated unto the Lord, everything that we do and are, are is for his glory. If you're reading the, the Old Testament in Leviticus and Exodus, and, you know, they're, they're preparing the tabernacle. They're building off. And he says, this is holy unto me. They were to eat the Passover lamb because it was holy unto the Lord. They weren't supposed to wait and eat leftovers the next day. Whatever they didn't eat that night, they were to burn it. And just they weren't allowed to leave it over because it was holy. It was separated. The priests had certain garments that they had to wear because they it was holy unto the Lord. What was God trying to teach his people? That he is holy. He is different. And that we are called to be holy. We are called to be different. Why? Because we've been dedicated. As I was reading this past week about they were making the garments for the priests and the different articles in the tabernacle. They were to sprinkle blood on them and do all the things that they were to do the, the, to dedicate them, to set them apart. And once that they were set apart, they were holy. And every time that the priests would wear the garments, they would become holy because they were wearing those sacred garments and as they would minister unto the Lord. And the medallion that they were to wear on their turban was holiness unto the Lord. It was a reminder to them that in serving God, they were to be holy because he is holy. That's why Paul writes in verse 17, whatever you do in word and deed, you do unto the Lord Jesus because we have been called to be holy because he is holy. And because we are called to be holy, everything that we do is holy and sacred. There can be no idle words or random deeds in the life of a Christian because everything that we say is to reflect the holiness of God. Everything that we do is to reflect the holiness of God. All is consecrated to him. You see, when they offered the sacrifice, they didn't leave some of it. They put the whole sacrifice on the altar that they offered to the Lord. And when we offer ourselves to God, we must stay on the altar, right? Romans says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. That means all of our life, every fabric of our being is to be consecrated unto the Lord. His name is our banner, and under it, all is done. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus, because there's power in that name. That's why when you go to work in the morning, you go to work in the name of Jesus. When you go shopping, you do it in the name of Jesus. Everything that we do, we do for His glory. This is why a life yielded to the Lordship of Jesus. This is what a life yielded to the Lordship of Jesus looks like. The power of the name of Jesus calls us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The power of the name of Jesus consecrates us and makes us holy. The power of the name of Jesus causes us to yield to him and declare that he is Lord over every aspect of our life. As Paul writes in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul writes in Romans, for it is written, which is in Isaiah 45, 23, all I, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. It's at the name of Jesus that demons shriek and, tr- and hell trembles in Luke ten seventeen. It's at the name of Jesus that chaos is replaced with peace, Mark 4, 35 through 41. It's at the name of Jesus that salvation is given, Romans 10, 13. It's at the name of Jesus that miracles happen, Mark 16, 17 and Acts 4, 30. It's at the name of Jesus that we have access to make our petition before the Father, John 14, 13. Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. His name represents his authority. So when we invoke his name, we are invoking the authority of the Lord Jesus. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. It's not some tagline that we say at the end of the prayer so we know that it's over. What we're doing is we're invoking his name. We're invoking his authority in our petition and our request. This is why in the Old Testament, God says, don't take my name in vain, because when we speak his name, we are invoking not just the name, but the authority that comes with that name. And that's why he says, don't do it and take it lightly. And so we call upon him. His name represents the authority. His name has been inscribed into our hearts. And we do so with a grateful spirit everywhere we go. We take his name, his authority with us with that grateful spirit because he's redeemed us and he's written his name upon our hearts. As we close, may we allow the power of the word of Christ to take up residence in our lives in abundance. And may we allow the power of the name of Christ to consecrate every aspect of our lives for his glory and fame. And as we yield to the word of Christ, may we yield to the power of the name that is above every name. May we strive to reflect the glory and the grandeur of the Lord Jesus in all that we do and in all that we have with a heart of gratitude to God the Father for redeeming us. Amen. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that it would dwell within us richly, abundantly. Lord, may it teach us and admonish us. May it convict us when we are wrong. May we yield to it. May we allow your word to shape us like clay in the potter's hands so that we may be the people of God, reflecting your glory to a world that is in desperate need of seeing Christ. Father, we pray that we would focus and change our attention on on how we do our work and our lives and what we say. May we understand that everything that we do is a reflection of who you are. Every word that comes out of our mouth, that may it be an act of worship and reflection of the glory of God. May everything that we do in the flesh and in our bodies, Lord, be a reflection of who you are and your holiness. So that the world around us would see a clear demonstration of the power of the gospel being evident in our lives. For your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that powerful name of Jesus, amen and amen.